Good day, everyone, and welcome to our HUMA book launch seminar. Thank you for joining us. Please note that this session is being live streamed onto our Facebook page and is being recorded here on Zoom. This is one series of other seminars which we have at HUMA, which you can find on our website. Please note that, uh, please be asked that all participants uh, include their name and surname um, in the in, in the participant section uh, for safety reasons, lest you be uh, placed in the waiting room. So the Humor Book launch is a forum of acknowledgement and critical engagement of work that is produced in and on the African continent, particularly that is relevant to Humor's research agenda. And this space provides a critical discussion of some selected books with authors that are invited to discuss uh, their topics with an audience and a panel of experts working in similar fields. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Babatunde Fagbaibo, who is a professor of law at the University of South Africa. His research focuses on the institutional development of the African Union, the AU, especially the process of endowing AU institutions with supranational powers. Other research interests of his include African politics, transnational policy, policy, policy analysis, critical approaches to international law, governance and democratization in Africa. He has been a consultant for the African Union on issues of democratization and constitutional governance and provides commentary in print and broadcast media on African affairs. He's a South African National Research Foundation C2 rated researcher and was a visiting professor of law at the University of Lisbon in 2015. He was also invited to give lectures at institutions such as the University of uh, Cumbria in, in Portugal, University of Pretoria, University of Cambridge and Carlton University in Canada. He is the editor in chief of the Southern African Public Law Journal. And also he is on the editorial and advisory board of the African Journal of Democracy and Governance and Nigerian Yearbook of International Law. His discussant for today is Dr. Femi Amao, who is a reader in law at the, Sus at the Sussex Law School in the UK. Dr. Femi was previously a senior lecturer in corporate and commercial law at the Sussex Law School. Uh, he's a lecturer in international commercial law at the Brunel Law School and was a lecturer at uh, University College Cork. He is the author of African Union Law, The Emergence of a Sui Generis Legal Order and Corporate Social Responsibility, Human Rights and the Law, Multinational Corporations in Developing Countries, both of which uh, were published by Routledge. He, he recently co-edited a book uh, called The Emergent African Union Law, Conceptualization, Delimitation and Application by Oxford, Unity, Oxford University Press. And Femi is a graduate of the University College uh, Cork in Ireland, where he, had, he undertook his PhD and a postgraduate certificate. And there he also received the president's scholarship for his research. He holds three LLMs, Master of Laws from the University of Warwick, um, University of Ibadan, and the Obafemi Owolo University. And his BA is from the University of Iloran. He has served at the Nigerian bar and has published widely in national and international journals, which, uh, and also has book chapters, which include um, Andre Noel Kemper and Ilias Lokokefalos. He is the PI for the African Union Law Research Project that is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Today, Professor, the professor will be talking about um, transcending member states, political and legal dynamics of building continental supranationalism in Africa, which is a book published this year by Springer. And this book is on the development policies and practices in the, e in the AU. Um, and we are very excited to hear more about this uh, book and policy building around the African uh, Union. 
And um, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Professor. We um, offer you the floor to speak about your book. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is it my turn now then? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to share my I'm going to share my screen so that I can share the few slides that I have uh, here. I hope you can see my slides now. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, and thank, uh, thanks to the organizers uh, at HUMA and also to Professor Babatunde Fagbayibo for uh, inviting me uh, to speak on this very important book and very significant uh, book uh, when it comes to uh, the continental legal order in Africa and also the African Union itself. Uh, it is a timely book and I think it's an important book uh, that, ha that would have significant you know, impact on how we think about the how we think about the African Union, how we think about the legal order that is emerging at that level, at the continental level, and also how we think about, you know, future reform, future development in relation to, you know, our, our understanding of what the African Union is, is and also what the African Union can do in terms of shaping outcomes across the continent. So congratulations to, uh, uh, Professor Fagba for you know for, for doing this work that I you know from reading it you know I'm, I'm quite impressed I know that uh, a lot of work has gone into this and I understand from reading uh, the introduction to the book that you know it, it has taken you know a, a long you know a sig significant number of years to work to produce uh, this uh, important uh, monograph now uh, to, to book to put things in context, and I'm going to move my slide forward. Uh, and to look at the, you know, the, the, the broader context of the significance of this book. I mean, there are three things that I want us to, you know, pay attention to and put at the back of our mind as we, as we look at the book. Uh, one of the key things in this book or the key significant, uh, significance of this book is the fact that it is navigating the dynamism of you know, a new legal order, an imagined legal order. So it underscores the fact that, look, law is never, you know, static. It is always changing. And what we are witnessing in Africa, even though it is not gaining the same kind of traction that it would have, you know, gained if it were to be happening in other parts of the, you know, of the globe. But this book draws our attention to this imagined legal order. And it navigates the, that emergence and it's the, the implication of that imagined legal order you know, in a very effective way. It conveys this message clearly and with strong evidence to the, you know, to the reader. And another important thing to note is that the book takes control of the narrative. And I think one of the problems that you know, African scholarship had after independence especially, and in years to follow, is this idea that we try, you know, if you like to piggyback on the back of concepts, ideas, or perceptions in terms of scholarship from the Western hemisphere. And what this book has done is to, if you like, take things back to say that, look, we don't have to do that. Because what is happening here have its own unique features. And we need to take back control of that narrative if we're going to be able to show the uniqueness of what is happening in the African continent and also be able to develop it further. And I think that is a, one, one other thing that the book has done brilliantly. So it presents, if you like, uh, to a large extent, to a global audience, developments that is happening in Africa that may not be gaining the same kind of traction that it should have had 
if it were to be happening uh, in another part of the globe. And these are very uh, significant points or, or significant uh, uh, if you like, achievement that the book uh, did successfully uh, put in place and that uh, any reader can look forward to when they read the book. So when you look at the book itself, the importance, some of the key points or some of the key ideas that emanates from that book is the idea that we now have in Africa a legal order that is operating to some extent beyond the member state level. So the book is drawing us away from domestic law, which has been the fixation in terms of our understanding. I mean, when we talk about, you know, African legal system, we talk about the various the different uh, national laws, uh, development at the national level. But this book has moved us beyond that to say that, look, the development now that is happening at the supranational level in Africa, that is the continental level, that is the, Afri the African uh, Union level. So refocusing you know, the trajectory or, or, or the discourse around beyond member state, I think is important and will have important implications down the line. The book also bring together you know, the political aspect and also the legal dynamics that are interacting to produce or to influence this legal order. And I think, you know, another thing, you know, that probably the uh, literature or the scholarship has been doing in the past is to try to separate the politics, you know, from the law. And the author in this book successfully convince us that, look, this is not something that you can separate because both influence each other. And what is happening in that context, in what the author called the uh, uh, political legal dynamics would have impact on how the idea of a legal order at, at the African Union level develops. And more important is the idea of supranationalism at the African Union level. I mean, of course, if you go to different forums, you know, some people tend to argue that, look, what is happening at the African Union level should be seen more as an intergovernmental uh, uh, cooperation or activities. But in reality, as the book, you know, strongly argue, there are things, there are issues, there are policies that are emerging at the African Union level that shows that what we're dealing with is not just intergovernmental. It has implications for member states, and it has implications for the citizens. And that is another important point that the book, that was well presented in the book to show us and to give us evidence of some of these things. I mean, the, the author in the book, you know, look at things like how the AU is funded through the, you know, 0.2% taxation, uh, you know, the, the new trade agreement, the African continental free trade agreement, uh, you know, the free movement protocol and all of that. This is significant and important normative development that will not only affect member states, but would also affect, would also impact on the citizens of the member states. And the book efficiently and effectively draws the reader's attention to this development and give credible evidence of, you know, this, uh, you know, what is happening to show that there's element of supranationalism that is emerging at the African Union level. And I said, that you know, the last thing that I have on my slide is the linkage with the idea of the African Union legal order. And, and like I said before, African Union law, African legal order is something that I have personal interest in. And I think the book ties in with this concept because when we talk about supranationalism, it implicates the idea that, look, there's a binding legal order or, a bind, or the perception of certain things that are happening at the AU level that is binding on member states and that will have direct impact on the citizens of those member states. So, I mean, these are very strong ideas that the book presented. And like I said, reading the book, the book uh, effectively argued with evidence that these dynamics 
are already happening at the African Union level and will have significant imp implications for member states and also the citizens of the member states. Now, I mean, one, I mean, one could debate the question of supranationalism and whether you know, the African Union itself envisaged such an idea. And one thing that I have noticed personally, and when you look at you know, instruments of the African Union, the various instrument, instruments you know, that have been made within the confines or within the jurisdiction of the African Union, you see that, look, even though it, it is not explicit, the idea of having you know, a supranational law, but some of these instruments actually reference you know, what one can call either laws of the union, if you look at the African Union Statute establishing the African Union Commission on International Law, it talks about laws of the union. And if you look at Article 28G of the Protocol on Amendment to the uh, Protocol on the Statute of the African Court of Justice and Human Rights, reference was also made in that uh, instrument to laws of the African Union. And as uh, Professor Fabaibu also mentioned in his, in, in, in his book, when you look at Agenda 2063, it also talks about this idea of, you know, deferring the establishment of a continental government to uh, uh, 2030. I mean, what all of this shows that even though within the Constitutive Act of the African Union, or even though the African Union institutions themselves don't really talk about this supranational idea, but it is implicit in some of the instruments that there is, you know, if you like an aspiration that at some point there's going to be something that we can refer to as African Union law. And if you have that, if you have laws of the union, the implication of that is basically that we are talking about a law that goes beyond the member state that has implications uh, from the top, which essentially means supranationalism in the same way that supranationalism will be understood in the context of the European Union. And another important, uh, and I use, uh, uh, you know, Justice Abdukawi A. Yusuf as, um, if you like, as a comparator, you know, not because I, you know, I, you know I, I'm trying to kind of like bring the ideas, you know, to a head in the conflict, but to say that, look, the similar idea that uh, Professor Fogba uh brilliantly presented in his book were also made in some way by the uh, the president of the or the former president of the International Court of Justice, uh, is still uh, in the at the International Court of Justice, uh, 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 Justice Yusuf, in a book that he wrote in 2014 called Pan Africanism and International Law, and he talked about this idea of the public law of Africa, which he described uh, this way. Uh, he said that this public public law of Africa provides a normative framework for the realization of the political social and economic objectives of Pan-Africanism. It also corresponds to the present day needs and aspirations of the peoples of the continent. Some aspect of this public law possess, however, a universal vocation in the sense that they may eventually influence the adoption of similar rules on the international plane. I mean, what is important you know, from, from the book and from this quotation is this idea of the public law of Africa, a normative framework that is operating from the continental level. And the approach that it took, uh, and if I move my slide forward, I mean, the approach that, is, that it took is to identify two categories, uh, particular ones he called the innovative and original ones. Those, these are laws that are, you know, normative instruments that are made at the AU level or at the African Union level that has implications for member states. And then he also talks about those that were influenced or that are used to supplement existing international law. That was his approach to try and situate this idea of supranational law within, uh, you know, within the concept of the public law of Africa, which I think you know, he tried to some extent to mirror you know, the domestic public law without, but trying to, to, to place it at the continental level. When I read his book, I thought it was interesting. But, but I think what he was pointing to, which he did not expressly state, is what uh, Professor Fawai Ibo has now concretized in his work, the idea of supranationalism, the idea of laws that are emerging 
at the continental level. So uh, looking at Professor Fogba Yigo's own uh, approach then from his book, uh, and one can compare this uh, prof Professor Yusuf's approach. I mean, and one could say, uh, you know, that Professor Fogba Yigo has advanced some of the arguments, you know, that were you know, they were made uh, in, in, in Justice Yusuf's uh, work without, you know, actually linking the two uh, in, in a formal sense. And what he has done is to look at, you know, the, the politics, like I said before, and the legal, uh, uh, you know, to interrogate the political and the legal policy uh, that are targeted at expanding AU, AU and its institutions in order to have if you like the ability to make this binding normative uh, instruments at the AU level. So he looks at that and looks for evidence to support that. And he also look at the state of integration. Integration has been part of the AU's agenda, you know, long-standing agenda from the years of the OAU up until now. And as he correctly argued, the trajectory or the movement of that integration agenda, how it has developed, an instrument that has been made to support it at various levels, has had impact or have implications on power allocation when it comes to the AU as compared to member states. And also importantly, he focused on policies and practices because even where the policy is not there, one could look at the practice of the AU and, as, and its institution to understand what is happening or what is imagined at the AU level. And as he pointed out, or to, although to a limited extent, is that he said that this uh, is similar to some of the develop, developments at the European Union. And I note that he, he, he placed significant caveat on how one can compare uh, the EU development to the AU. Uh, because as he correctly pointed out, and I'll come back to that point in a minute, the idea is not to copy or to try to replicate uh, the, you know, what is happening in the EU or to try to create a mini EU within the, within the AU, it's not gonna work because the dynamics are different. And as he correctly pointed out in his book, the political influences, the legal influences uh, in Africa is very different from the context of the, you know, of the European Union. And so it's a, a one size fit all approach or a copying and pasting approach would not work in that regard. And, and some of the things that he said in terms of then how do we proceed when it comes to the understanding of supranationalism or the idea of supranationalism at the African Union level, uh, it made a point and something that I refer to as re-engineering that we have to rethink the underpinning ideology. I mean, like I said at the beginning, uh, the scholarship prior to now has always been to look at things or ideas from the context of uh, paradigms in the West. So when we talk about, even when you look at our jurisprudence, I mean, the way we have been taught jurisprudence, we tend to kind of like look at, at ideas, you know, from how, you know, legal uh, theories talk about jurisprudence in the West. So the point here is basically that we have, if we're going to tell our own story, if we're going to present, you know, in an effective way, what is happening at the African Union level in a way that is meaningful to us and also contributes to uh, the global discourse around uh, legal orders, then we have to take an approach that is fitting within the context of Africa. And I think that is what this book has done effectively to say that, look, we have to rethink the operational ideology we have to move away from this idea of trying to fit developments in Africa within a paradigm that is Eurocentric, for example, or you know, Western more broadly. We have to take a more Afrocentric approach because that takes into context, uh, you know, into the whole framework, what is unique about what is happening in Africa. And all, he also said, you know, we, I mentioned earlier that integration is something that has always been part of the OAU AU agenda. And that has, I mean, this idea of integration also have a significant implication when it comes to how we understand what's happening at the African Union level. And when you look at the way, you know, the approach that in the past that have been taken in looking at the idea of integration, as rightly pointed out, 
just the idea of having a federation, something called the United States of Africa, or a complete union government, or a confederation, or focusing on the sub-regional level before we now have the African Union in place. So we have to interrogate all of this development and see how we arrive at the African Union and the implication of that. And I think this is another thing that he did very well because basically one of the you know, underlying theme of that book is that by having the Constitutive Act of the African Union and by putting the African Union and, and its institutions in place, you know, we have moved from this idea of just being intergovernmental cooperation at the African Union level more to creating the ability to have normative instruments at the AU level that will have supranational implications. And you also talk about mental models, which you know, I will see more like perceptions. So we have to rethink how we look at Africa in the context, in the, in the global context. Uh, you mentioned the mantra about African solution for African problems. So we could say African scholarship, you know, for to address African developments. I mean, although one could say that's probably what could be linked to the you know third world approach to international law, the twill approach. But I think in the context of this book, it expands beyond just looking at international law. It says now we can look at this legal order within Africa that is separate from international law. And I think that is important. And as I mentioned earlier, the book is also significant because if you like, one of, I don't think I've seen a work dedicated to bringing the politics and the, the legal together at the African Union level up until now. So this book is significant also, also in, that, in that regard. So there are several lessons that we can learn from this uh, path-breaking and leading work in this area. You know, we, as, you know, as I've said repeatedly, the idea of the indivisibility of law and politics is one that is important to note because this has significant implication on, on how we understand supranationalism in Africa. And then we also, from this book, know that when it comes to understanding supranationalism in Africa, one would need to look at the activities. It's not just the policy, it's not just the instruments, but also some of the developments that are happening and try to see the implication of that. I mean, one thing that he mentioned in the book, for example, like I said, with this idea of funding the African Union with 0.2% uh, you know, on tax of eligible imports. I mean, one could look at that without really looking at the implication. But the book tells us the implication that, look, this is basically having a law that is placing on member state directly a requirement, a legal requirement to make certain payments. That changed the whole complexion because it is saying that you have a binding law that is coming at, uh, at the African Union level, just as an example. And he also emphasized the limitation in copying the EU approach. Like I said before, this story needs to be told and it's, it needs to be told from an African perspective. And the book has done that brilliantly. And he also emphasized the need to strengthen AU institutions. If the AU is gonna be effective in achieving the integration agenda and also in achieving supranationalism at that level, then there will be the need to provide a level of strengthening to those institutions. And that will come from member states and will come from uh, uh, operatives at, at, at the African Union level. And another significant thing that he mentioned, and which I think we can all agree upon, is when it comes to uh, measurable data in Africa. We want research on Africa. We want more uh, engagement you know, with research scholarship in Africa. But to do that, we need data. We need very viable data, and that is absent. And that is something that we need to be work on at the African Union level, also at the member states level. And the book as a whole, I, I say, and I, I will argue that there are important uh, points in that book that will help with the designing of a policy framework within the African Union and its, uh, and its institutions going forward. So, I mean, look, and these are just some of the examples of lessons that can be learned. There are a lot more uh, that can be learned uh, from that book, and I will highly recommend the book uh, because uh, it is not only useful for the African Union uh, and its member states, uh, but also for you know all Africans, because I think at this point we all need to engage 
uh, with this idea of the African Union, its implications and the potential supranational implication that it could have. So uh, that is all that I've got to say uh, for now. And I will also, you know, talk a bit more uh, with, uh, you know, by interrogating or asking uh, Professor Faber go some questions on his book uh, after this presentation. Again, thanks for listening and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Femi, for uh, providing that um, uh, rich overview of uh, Professor Fagbaibo's book. Um, Professor Fagbaibo, would you like to uh, add or to include any comments that uh, Dr. Femi has provided on this wonderful epistemic book? Um, thank you all. More like, do I have anything to subtract from it? No, just joking. Uh, yes, um, I want to thank uh, Professor Mao's um, uh, presentation uh, about the book um, and also for this platform as well to, 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 to talk about the idea of the book. I think um, Professor Mao has really covered some of the underpinnings of the book. Um, so I would say the three key um, issues I looked at you know, uh, when I did the summary of the book, uh, three key points I looked at was one, obviously, the indivisibility of um, indivisibility and interrelatedness of law and politics. I had used um, the example of a bicycle, um, saying when you pedal a bicycle, right, the right foot and the left foot have to actually continue going back and forth. It's as Shivji puts it more pointedly that um, law is essentially a concentrated form of politics. So we, we in the legal fraternity at times, so we, we, we miss that point. We think everything is about the law, forgetting the fact that law again precedes the writing of normative instruments. I'm sorry, politics rather, precedes the writing of normative instruments and politics is at the heart if not 100% in terms of implementing the kinds of laws we have. Um, you would see, for example, free movement of persons across the continent, even in ECOWAS, that is adjudged as one of the best on the continent, there's still lots of obstacles. So try to drive through both borders of ECOWAS, then you will understand that politics play more important role in shaping the way people are allowed to, to, to move despite normative frameworks. So that's very important. Then another, I, the, the second part is actually the, you know, trying to create an assessment method. How do we assess the African Union? Because context plays a key role. Um, we can sit down here and say, look, these are the, the aspirations we have for the African Union and all of those things. Is it supranational? Is it intergovernmental? And all of those things. But we need to be more contextual in the way, you know, look at many activities around us that speak to, 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 to the African Union and, of course, implementation of of the African Union. We now have an African continent, a free trade area coming into play, which again, African leaders actually, I mean, by now you have about 45 countries have actually agreed to, to it. So you see the rapidity of implementation of that norm. By the time we know it, I mean, if all things being equal, we might actually have a, some sort of a, a strong um, a trade, um, you know, Pan-African uh, trade uh, uh, instrument. Then, Lastly, is to also begin to ask ourselves that um, after we have looked at those things, then how do we see the world? Um, this morning, I was actually talking to a couple of friends about, you know, the way African leaders usually, I mean, they're, they're going to the U.S. now. And according to news reports, Biden has not even scheduled to meet any of them. So they are just going to the U.S. and, you know, laughing and, and doing all sorts of things. And the question is, how does that inform our strategic worldview? Worldview is very, very important. How do we see ourselves? And because we need to understand how we see ourselves, then to be able to deal with the world um, effectively. So supranationalism, you know, the, the whole idea of creating an African union that is able to assert itself, that is able to create binding laws, that is able to also move the masses of our people on the ground and be able to, you know, um, you know, create that kind of, um, take us to the, to the promised land, let me, for, for, for lack of a better uh, phrase, we need a strategic worldview, a worldview that is not always, that doesn't always start from a defeatist, a defeatist perspective, one that um, sees um, 
you know, uh, that this is not a zero sum game. You know, we lose here, then we gain there, you know, for, for, for the common good. So I think if I've been able to, and uh, uh, Prof uh, Amao has done uh, a very good work in actually highlighting all of those things. Uh, if I want anyone to gain anything from this book is to just see that, um, yes, we are going to create processes on the continent. And of course, law, is actually law is evolutionary. I mean, it it keeps evolving. It's not static, and we we who knows who knows what African Union will be like in the next um ten years. Who knows? Um, I think it was uh, 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 the two uh, East African journalists in twenty thirteen had written uh, um separately an op-ed for the East African Review and said um, the future of African integration is um for we are likely going to have three or four mega subregions. And the African Union will fall into oblivion. Uh, nobody will talk about it anymore. We'll be talking about those big subregions, mega subregions. But of course, we're all speculating here. Um, but anyways, let me stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. I, I would like to invite anyone in the audience that might have any questions or reflections on the professor's book. I myself, I'm coaxed to reflect on um, our human disobedience workshops that have been very fundamental this year on thinking uh, about epistemic disobedience and especially delinking, as what Walter Mignola would say, delinking from the Eurocentric epistemology. And I think your book encourages us to rethink, as Dr. Amao said, and delink from the norm, which uh, kind of universalizes a legal um, infrastructure. So I'd like to invite anyone in the audience who has questions or a reflection, um, you're welcome to uh, use the hand emoji to raise your hand and uh, we can have a discussion. Well, okay, while we wait for hands up, Okay, here we go. We have someone, Nigo, not sure if I'm saying it right, Nigo, Wine, Nigo, or Nsiko, I'm saying it in my language, Nigo. <laughs> You're welcome to uh, have your comment, followed by, after Nigo, we have Mati. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, uh, I'm not allowed to turn on my camera, but I can just like ask my, my question quickly. Yeah, I, I'll just go to like one of the last points that uh, Professor Babatunde has just pointed out, uh, referring to, yeah, the great Professor Issa Shivji, that law is a concentrated form of politics. Now, just on that basis, like, do are, are we really seeing the politics on the continent? Yeah, particularly the politics of our leaders supporting uh, these supranational powers that we are we are we are trying to like to attach or like to justify for the African Union. Do I answer or allow Mathieu to well would you like to have two questions or yeah, I can take okay. yeah I can take the two okay. questions and... all right uh, Matsi please go ahead Uh, good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. I would like to thank um, both speakers for their wonderful presentation. I have one or two questions, actually. One question for Prof. Fagbaibo and one comment. Um, I would like to find out, Prof. Fagbaibo, in your own opinion, can we really have a stronger African Union without the funding, the support, and the meddling of the European Union or other races outside Africa? That is uh, my, my first question. And how are we going to unshackle us from the chains of uh, Europe and other continents? And then I would also like to have your personal opinion. You were saying, um, you were speaking to your number, a number of your friends regarding the future of African Union, whether it's going to get stronger or we are going to see this mega super 
sub-regions that you are talking about. In your own opinion, having read in the field, working in the field, interacting with um, members of African Union and its institutions, what is your predictions of the African Union in the coming 10 to 15 years? We moved from OAU, we are now at the AU. Are we going to see a better institution or it's everything all doom? Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I think I have about three or four questions, very difficult questions. You <laughs> one, I think Matsie wants me to be a Sangoma here um, and uh, follow the lines of my of my phobias and be able to predict and read into the future. But anyways, I will I'll, I'll get back to that. That's a very difficult one. I'll leave it for the last uh, uh, thing. Uh, the first one by Nchiko was that um, uh, and it speaks to political willingness. It speaks to the extent to which African leaders are able to allow for 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 moving, and I and one of the things I argued in the book is that um, you know if you expect all the fifty five African states to agree to this supranationalism project, then you would rather uh, then you I mean you are expecting snowfall in Lagos, right? And you know there will never be snowfall in Lagos, um, only if you're watching a a sci-fi or you know. Um, nobody would, um, not all the 55 would agree to that. And one of the things that recommended in the book is to start thinking around flexibility approach. So flexibility approach in the sense that countries that are willing and able should move ahead. Um, we will not allow ourselves to be bogged down by members who do not want to move ahead. A very interesting thing that happened a couple of, uh, last week actually, not a couple of weeks ago, last week, the African Union has a, a program called um, S SWATM. Um, it's about single airspace transport, you know, trying to make yeah, air transportation in Africa seamless. And um, for people, I mean, it's very expensive to travel this continent. So they're trying to kind of harmonize uh, transportation, air transportation structures. Um, and of course, they've been talking about it and talking about it. It's been there for years. But what happened last week? 15 countries decided to move ahead with it not waiting for the rest. That is a very, very, very important example. And nobody said anything about it. And I, I remember telling someone that this is a typical example of how member states that are willing and able can move ahead. The rest can catch up later. We do not all have to, you know, as the Yorubas will say, sleep in one direction, sleep and put our heads in one direction, right? Uh, many roads lead to the market. So that's one, one way, um, um, flexibility. Then moving on to Mathieu's questions, um, she had asked about um, um, our external influences. Um, one of the things I also looked about in the book is that you cannot also create, you know, you can't be running a, an integration project or regional integration project on a donorized um, a perspective. You, at some point, and that's what the AU has been trying to do, but we need to be very serious about it because lack of, this whole idea of not wanting to form the African Union is also tied to some, you know, to a very defective mental modeling. One of the things the AU also needs to do is to cut its coat according to its size. So, or cu cut its cloth according to its cloth. <laughs> because if you're cutting it according to your size, you might still be pushing. Um, cut it according to what you have and be able to look at all these processes and see what can be funded and at some point reduce this dependence. Because this dependence cannot go well. Um, as Thomas Ankara said, it will feed you, controls you in the final analysis. And the AU continues to complain about this, about the EU, um, how it uses its funding to actually manipulate and do all sorts of things. So for as long as the funding comes from outside, we will not get to that um, destination, unfortunately. Um, it's, 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 I mean, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's just going to be a joke. We will just be moving based on what others dictate and want for us. Um, then um, Mathieu wants me to look into the future and wear a Sangoma cap. Um, if, if I were to, to, to look into the future, I think um, if you ask me this question, um, maybe 10 years ago, I'll tell you that um, maybe we would have those mega subregions, but at the rate at which things are happening, I think that there's going to be a movement towards strengthening the African Union um, for various reasons. 
At times, it's not, um, it might not also necessarily be uh, altruistic. So African Union leaders, some might not necessarily see, but they might be doing it for their own, what you call the um, shadow uh, regionalism, regime boosting activities, where you strengthen the African Union in order to strengthen your own domestic politics and uh, internal, uh, internal issues. So I think there would be some sort of, but what I can also say is that that development will not cover the 55 member states. I don't think it will cover the 55 member states. I think member states will look at things. There will be you know, lots of flexible frameworks within the African Union in moving ahead with things. So for example, look at free movement of persons. Already South Africa has said, South Africa was the first to say it, will, it has strong, strong objections to free movement protocol. Um, Botswana also said it, that it will never be part of that um, protocol. But um, there will be other countries. Um, Rwanda and the rest are ready to be part of it. So you will find things like that. And of course, um, when we see benefits from it, maybe it will inspire others to, 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 to join. Um, I hope uh, I've not disappointed you with that question, uh, with the answer rather. <laughs> and if I may just add something uh, to that, yeah. and um, I'm gonna say something that may be a bit controversial now. I mean, when you look at the history of the African Union, when it comes to funding, I'm going back to the funding now, apart from member states, the funding have come from three potential sources. And this is the controversial one, Gaddafi in Libya, China, and the European Union, okay? And I mean, the point is that, you know, you ask yourself the question, if what happened to Gaddafi didn't happen to him, would he still have hard role to play? when it comes to how the African Union is funded. And then the question then will be, if it was to be Gaddafi funding the African Union, in addition to the member states, would we be in a better position to negotiate better terms with somebody like Gaddafi, even though we may not like him, or some people may not like him, I don't have too much of it. I know that it's problematic, but every leader in Africa is problematic. Would we have a better, would, would we be in a better position to negotiate terms, or the African Union being in a negotiate terms you know, funding with somebody like a David compared to the EU or China that dictates to us what we do. And that is the question. And I think it goes back to the idea of how we appreciate what happens within Africa itself. Because I remember when I did my book I, and I was going to acknowledge, you know, the contribution of Gaddafi to the creation of the African Union because we, 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 we kind of like smartly tried to avoid acknowledging that he was instrumental. He was key to the establishment of the African Union, that he was. So we may like it or not, but the point is that we have to connect back to what we have and try to work with what we have rather than, you know, basing our views on what some other people want us to have. You know what I mean? So I mean, that is what I was going to say. It may sound a bit controversial, but I think that, you know, that's important to note. Um, oh, yes. Just to quickly add for one, two minutes, um, saying, of course, Africa, you know, has experimented or tried with um, trying to, to create all sorts of external alternative fundings. We all remember the Obasanjo panel of 2015, the panel that says, let's look at all sorts of ways of creating avenues. So saying all the flight in and out of Africa, there'll be certain percentage, all phone calls, all text messages, that was before WhatsApp, right? Uh, text messages, there will be certain cents and you know, hotel, hotels, if you, you know, travel on holiday, tourism tax and things like that to the African Union. But all of those things were, uh, were discounted because um, mem some member states whose uh, economy is based on uh, tourism, for example, said, no, if you do that, then it means it will be more expensive to come here. So again, it also shows you that kind of, you know, the, the tension and the ability not to want to see the bigger picture. So this money can actually be generated. It can be generated internally. I mean, um, from various sources, but the thing is, we just need to sit down and craft a very feasible way of, uh, of, of, of generating uh, the, the, the needed income for, for the African Union rather than you know, running after donors all the time. Thank you so much, Professor Bakbaibo and um, Femi for your intervention. Um, is there anybody else in the audience who has a question or a comment? I myself has a, have a question, but I will first ask uh, the audience for any questions my, from my colleagues and other guests 
in the room. Okay, well, maybe I'll go ahead with my question. Um, so Dr. Mao was speaking about rethinking about uh, Pan-African legal instrument. And uh, several times you mentioned about uh, strategizing or, or political strategy to, that goes towards uh, reframing a Pan-African legal instrument. My question is what might be some practical efforts towards such strategies uh, that would feed into uh, the rethought legal instrument of Pan the Pan-African uh, guideline? What can we do now towards the goal of, of the Pan-African legal instrument on a political space, for example, as uh, the book is encouraging us to do? Yeah. Can I answer now? Yes, you may. Yeah, and, and, and thanks for that. And I think there are practical things that could be done, but, you know, by certain institutions of the African Union itself. And you take, for example, say the African court and the willingness in terms of how they interpret some of the instruments and how they, you know, kind of like make their orders when it comes to member state interest. And you can see with some of what they've done. I mean, you look at some of their decisions. I can't remember the particular case, but there was a, a particular case involving uh, people that were involved in the, uh, you know, during the Egypt's, um, the political uprising in Egypt. Uh, you know, they brought a, call, a case to the African court. And in giving judgment, the African court essentially said it has the power to award uh, compensation to these individuals in monetary terms and that the state will have to implement that, which is kind of like making an order that's impact on member states. So the African, uh, I mean, the, the African court itself can expand on this when it comes to how it interpret uh, instrument coming from the African Union as having direct impact on member states and being able to pronounce on that, even though it is not sitting as an appellate court uh, on member states, but because of the power that is inherent in it, it should be able to do it. It's done it on occasions, and I think they could expand on that. And secondly, I think within the, of course, the African Constitutive Act itself will need to be reformed. Though I think one of the areas of reform that is important will be the powers of the parliament. You can't have this you know, decorative parliament that we have at the moment. You need a parliament that works, that is able to make uh, you know, effective instruments, which is something that I think needs to be addressed even within uh, the whole idea of reforming the African Union itself. So, I mean, that, those are two examples. There are a lot more that can be done, but I think those two will be quite significant. Forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Mao. We have another question uh, or, or hand raised by Ozome Nam Ogbu in the audience. You're welcome to ask your question, Ogbu, or comment. Can you hear me, Ozome Nam? Not sure if they can unmute. Let me see. Not sure what the matter. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Professor Fabaibo, uh, for, um, uh, for the uh, amount of work you've put into uh, this um, book and uh, your so many articles that feed into it. Uh, but what I wonder equally as the, um, the in the book and the contents is do the sub-regional organizations uh, in in Africa how do you how do they interact with AU and what is the order of um, of uh, importance in the sub-regional organizations uh, I, I mean uh, in the I mean in the midst of the uh, member countries as it concerns AU. I don't know if I've been able to point out my question clearly. You know, there are so many sub-regional organizations like ECOA, SADEC, and others who, who have influences on the member countries. So what are, what, how do they interact, these sub-regional organizations interact with the AU and, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the member states, you know, 
in, in cases where they have conflicting, you know, objectives and all those. Okay, thank you. Bye. Um, thank you, Ozo. Um, I that's I mean that's a question that has plagued the African Union since its establishment. So, in what is um, what the relationship between the African Union and sub-regional organizations? So now to start, the AU recognizes eight, right? There are more way more than eight sub-regional organizations, but it recognizes eight in such a way that it wants sub-regional uh, organs to it recognizes them as a, the building block towards the eventual creation establishment of that supranational structure. So regional organs are not answerable to the AU. They are not members of the AU. Only member states are members of the AU. Um, at times, there are conflicts. We've seen it so many times in terms of um, who should take charge. But the AU is of the view that in some cases, um, based on the issues of uh, the, the, the principle of subsidiarity, um, subregional organs are allowed to be the first, to take the first line of action. And if all else fails, then the AU can step in. Um, the protocol, there's a protocol which has just passed now, um, has just become law that actually regulates this relationship. Now, the question is whether this protocol, because if this protocol is fully implemented, then we would say that sub-regional organizations can be answerable to the African Union, but it's still early days, right? It just, um, it just it came into law in November, 2021. So it's still early days. We have not seen um, the, the, the fruit of it. So what we are looking at or what we are hoping is that sub-regional organ organs would actually be the implementing arms or the implementing structures of the African Union. Some of them have more influence on their member states than the African Union itself. The African Union can be a bit distant from member states. And some of them are also, you know, their member states who have strong influence. So you think of Nigeria and ECOWAS. You think of South Africa and SADC. Um, who have strong influence on those um, regional. So meaning if the AU needs to do anything, all it needs to do is to first talk to the hegemons, the so-called regional hegemons, and of course, they get the ball rolling. So that relationship, again, it's been kind of, a, it's not been a straightforward one. There are times they are both competing for money from the funders. At times, you know, this divide and rule tactics where funders will first give money to the sub-regional organs and not give to the AU. But the plan, or the, the, the plan of the AU as, from its constitutive act is that at some point, all the sub-regional organs will collapse and become the AU itself, you know, because they are the building blocks. Um, but um, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, if you check the news today, uh, China flagged off, um, um, it's going to be building the new ECOWAS secretariat uh, for, uh, in 26 months. Um, of course, we are not going to be build a secretariat and collapse the organization in the next five years. So, um, but anyways, hopefully they will be able to contribute more to to the African Union. So that's what where we are uh, at now uh, at the at the African Union level. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you so much, Professor Fagbaibo. Um, we're almost at the top of the hour. Thank you for uh, uh, that presentation. I'll give one more chance to the audience for anyone with a question or a comment. I myself, I am um, quite uh, inspired by uh, the writing of your book. Thank you for sharing that summary, which you all can find uh, on the Humor website. Um, I think your book inspires us to, to think epistemolog epistemologically differently from uh, what is universal, and to kind of interrogate what it means uh, legally for, for individual countries in Africa, what it really means for a unified framework in, in these sub-regions that you speak about. And um, although I'm not a legal scholar myself, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm interested to learn more about and, and broaden my understanding on. Um, I'm not sure if there are any further questions, but since we are already at five o'clock South Africa time, I'd like to take this moment to, again, thank you both for uh, being a part of our book launch series here at Humor. We appreciate your, your, your intellectual work that you're doing. Um, and we invite, we'd like to invite everyone uh, for our next um, sessions at Humor. We have a range of seminars we, we, we host. This is one of them, Humor Book Launch and Book Lunch on Mondays. 
next week we have a book lunch with Professor Camilla Hawthorne from the University of California. She will speak about contesting race and citizenship. And on the 15th of December, we have a humor interdisciplinary series seminar with Oke Chuku Mwafo, um, who will be speaking about uh, their colonial work from Lagos. And uh, thereafter, we will end the year and resume our, our, our series yeah, around February in 2023. So this has been a wonderful book discussion on transcending member states, political and legal dynamics of building continental supranationalism in Africa. And uh, thank you for encouraging us to think otherwise, to, for encouraging us to de-link from the norm. And um, I'd like to wish everyone a wonderful day and um, be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, before we close, can I just 